<laughs> Morning, folks. Let's talk about lab four grading. <clears throat> Gee, I didn't even quiet people down. I expect that to quiet people down. So uh, the first thing is, you will notice that there is a requirement in the assignment that you produce a, a low-pass filtered version of the PWM and display it on the oscilloscope. That is designed not only to help me or the grader understand what your, what your system is doing dynamically, it's, it's to help you debug. And so one of the very first things you should do is to build the low-pass filter that goes to the scope so that you can debug the dynamics of your system. You don't have to guess whether it's overshooting. You don't have to look through a thousand lines barfing out of the UART. You can see it on the oscilloscope. So build that. Don't wait till the TA says you can't check out until you've built it. Because he or she will. So, PWM is running at what speed? Impossible. Can't run at 62.5. Won't work. The bandwidth of the, of the opto isolator is only 1,000 hertz. Therefore, you have to be running at 1,000 or slower. So what frequency are you using? Good answer. <laughs> so this is maybe a kilohertz or so. Maybe a little less. What's the time constant of the motor? You spin the motor by hand, it decays down. What's the time constant of decay? You need to know that so to, for the, to have, have anything run. What's the time constant? One second. I actually said it in class a bunch of times, too. So tau of the motor is about one second. So what should you set this tau to? You want to smooth this signal, but not interfere with this dynamics. So it's got to be faster than a second and slower than a millisecond. So what are you going to set it to? How about 0.1? 0 0.1, .1 seconds. What's the input impedance of the scope? Feather and equivalent input impedance of the scope. Huh? One meg. That puts an upper limit on this resistor of about 100K. <coughs> Man, I might even want to go to 10K. If you go to one meg here, it's easier to make a long time constant, but you will find that the voltages you read are only half as big as they should be. Build that, first thing, as soon as you get in the lab. Secondly, the next thing about this is that we have thoughtfully provided an interface for you to record the output of the scope directly onto your computer, onto the desk computer. So there's a piece of Tektronics code on the desk machine whose name I can never remember. It's Open Desktop or something like this. So do search the start menu for the string open and go to something that has open and desktop in it. I think it's tech open desktop or something of the sort. That'll open up an interface that allows you to record over a USB cable from the oscilloscope directly into a JPEG on the computer which you can then handily cut and paste into your report, which you should do for this lab. Because when you step, when you step the speed from 500 to 1,000, it sure would be nice to document what the dynamics of your system looks like. I've seen some that look like this, which seems about right. This being the low-pass PWM output. But you have the ability to hook up a USB cable directly. Do this easily. It's no overhead. Do it. Put it in your report.
<clears throat> Any questions on that? Secondly, a couple of people have noticed, a few people have noticed that if they have a, a integral term, of course they get a lower static error in the, in the um, RPM, but they also have this effect that again, if we're looking at low pass of the PWM, that's why it's essential to have this output, you'll see little torque bumps at uniform intervals and the higher you make the I term coefficient the closer together these get. These torque bumps are caused because the integral builds up, builds up, the speed gets closer and closer to the target, overshoots it, the integral goes to zero, the speed now starts to drop, the proportional term kicks in and brings it back up to, uh, towards speed. So you get this oscillation, and you can hear it even on the motor. You can hear the torque on the motor change. Go, eh, eh, eh. <clears throat> so what are you going to do about that? Well, you could lower the I, ter the I coefficient, but then you lose some of the static gain stability. What else could you do? Put a moving window on your integral term. That's a good idea. Another group today tried something which is, uh, what did you end up doing? You ended up... So when the error term changed sign, instead of setting the integral to zero, multiply the current value by 0.8 instead of setting it to zero. And that brings it down, if the, if the, if the RPM is too low and building up, so you have your desired RPM here and you're building up slowly because of the integral term when you cross the line instead of resetting the integral to zero reset it to point eight and then you'll be just below the line again and that stabilized it quite considerably did it not? Got rid of, did it get rid of all the torque peaks? yes okay so that's a that's a interesting ob ob uh, observation. What other tricks have people found? Measuring faster in what sense? Oh, so you're saying instead of doing 50 a second, do 100 a second? Interesting. Why would that stabilize it if you're only making measurements once per rotation? Oh, so you're getting a you're getting a pulse per blade, and so at at a thousand RPM, that's about a hundred pulses per second, right? A thousand RPM is sixteen R, RPS, right? Revolutions per second. Yes. Yeah. Times seven is about a hundred kinda close sorta maybe but so so that says that you should update about a hundred times a second then that's good observation too yeah you're quite right if you're making a hundred observations a second you ought to be updating a hundred times a second rather than fifty <clears throat> the reason I said fifty was I was kind of assuming that people were using the half white half black hub which by the way is the hardest thing to stabilize because the you only get one observation per rotation and at 500 Hertz that takes uh, that's only eight revolutions per second so that's hundred and twenty five milliseconds between measurements That's so slow so as I said in the very first lecture low those weeks ago bef before break so it's like infinitely far ago back in the day that's the word yes back in the day the uh, I mentioned that you would get better stability if you if you shine light through the blades or painted all the blades white let's say you're doing a reflection system now you're using the reflection system you don't want to change the geometry you don't want to tear your circuit apart 
Just paint white dots on all A7 blades and point the uh, and point the LEDs at the white dots on the blades rather than the white dot on the hub. If the white dot on the hub is confusing, you got a magic marker, make it black. I know it's late in the game, but this doesn't is not a big complicated thing to do. Well, that helps quite a lot. That's twice as good. Does it need something else to change, though, in terms of calculation? The only, calc the only thing you need to change is, if, let's say that you, instead of having the hub painted like this, you paint it like this, white, white, black, black. Clearly, you're going to count the number of pulses and divide by two to get the RPM. If you paint the, all of the, if you paint four out of the seven, don't do that, paint the seven blades, then, then, uh, then you have to divide by seven to get the RPM. Exactly true. You should you should scale. You should you should calculate the PID more often. But that's an easy change too. You're just changing the scheduling deadline in the in the PID uh, task. That's right. Uh huh. No. If you're doing seven, you divide by seven. You update seven times as often. If you make a quadrant, you update twice as often. Well, right now it's uh, uh, no. Fifty was already faster than fifty was already faster than it needed to be. So you don't have to go to three fifty. And I don't. You might be able to make it that fast. Uh, but I think uh, probably a hundred or a hundred and fifty is fast enough. Anybody kept the RPM at a thousand RPM within ten? Within twenty? Yeah, okay. Within fifty? Haven't tried it yet. Yeah, all right. Uh, how many? How about at 500 hertz? 500 RPM. What have people been seeing for errors? A lot more. A lot more because of the stability problem, right? Plus or minus 50. Plus or minus 100. 20 yeah. percent. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot. You, you're, but but you have an art. But but what's the? I, I see I see furled brows over here. What's the? What are you getting? I think it was within, within like 20 or 30. Within 20 or 30 at 500. How, and you're, but you're doing seven blades, right? Seven blades, right. Which helps the stib stability yeah, quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions about lab four? Scanf, scanf. Yes. But it's yes, but just like f printf requires linking a new library, using s uh, f scanf to re to input a float requires linking a new library. The directions for doing that are on the debugging page. Item 15, I believe. I've looked at it a few times in the last couple of days. I believe it's item 15. So we want. You got a laptop open? Tell me what the. Yeah, so that's that's what I, I sometimes do to dis dissuade laptop uses. I'll make people look up stuff I can't remember the answer to.
percent <coughs> you're saying that percent F works but percent 3.2 F does not without linking a new library as far as I know this doesn't work without linking a new library yeah What does it print? I don't think it works. But well, I believe you, but but make sure you aren't linking that library. You are linking it. Okay, well then, yeah. But remember that you can always avoid messing around with these link libraries by using D to string F, right? D T O S T R F, which is in standard lib, to go from a number to a string float. And there's string float to D also, which allows you to just read a. F Let me start that sentence over. Since I seem to have stalled on an S sound. There's a, there is a routine in standard lib that it has some name like string f to d or something of this sort that allows you to input a string with a percent s using f scan f and then convert it internally into a float. And that's easier to set up than changing the link libraries. Pardon me? You were right. It's item 15. Item 15, okay. Whenever I tried to use the D2 string app functions, it would just crash the text. Yeah, it didn't work for me. Yeah, it didn't work for me. I was able to link the things and just use the floats directly, but whenever I tried to use those, the pass would crash. Did you change the stack size? Stack crash? It's crashed? Yeah, it doesn't like the stack. Wait, 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 wait. So it's worked for some people, not for others? Oh, that's the worst. Well, what did you, so how big was your stack size for the, for the task? Was it in the hundreds? Yeah. Yeah, I think I made it up to 150. And it worked. Oh, dear. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> It's just a function call, right? So it should work. Maybe a, well, it's open source. I suppose we could <laughs> figure it out. Release an update. So I don't. I don't know what. To, I don't know what to tell you then. Maybe you go for the link libraries. That's a, certainly a way to do it too. You just you input scaled floats. So if you so if you want to put in 2.9, you type in 29 and then divide by 10 internally. So when you type in, you just mul you you mentally multiply everything by 10 or 100, and that's perfectly good. And and also low cost in terms of thinking and computer time. So all good. Anything else on lab four? Any questions on final project logistics, ordering parts, um, lab time? Are we going to check? Oh, you're quite right. So what you're saying is that we have to come up with, there's currently 94 people in the class, in case anybody's interested, 94 times 12 seat hours. Seat hours. We have, we have 22 computers, so that's 44 seats. So we need to more or less come up with... Um, uh, looks like about 94 divided by 4 
uh, hours a week, which is only 25 hours a week. That's easy. I'm going to be in there 25 hours a week. However, experience shows that the first 10 days the lab is open full time. It's like a ghost town in there. It's the tumbling weeds rolling down the aisles, you know, the whispering wind and not much else. So, on the other hand, the last week gets pretty steaming. Particularly since the air conditioning doesn't work well in May. So, uh, so start early and often. So, like, for mine, it's easier for me to not work in the lab because I've been stuck. Is there any, like, a compensation for that? If you want to work at home, it is fine with me. You can't take any of my stuff out of the lab. No, no LCDs, no whiteboards, no SDK 500s, no cables. Nothing leaves the lab. You got your own stuff? Work at home. But check in with your TA once a week, obviously. Come to lab. Show your TA what you're doing. <clears throat> Leave again. Go, 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 uh, go home. Use your. Do you have a logic analyzer at home? Oh my God. That's that's my that's my uh, criterion for uh, into it of, of of nerdliness. Logic analyzer at home. Yeah, I, I don't have one. I wish I did. I have a. Uh, 150? Sweet. I have a vacuum tube oscilloscope at home. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's not. It's 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 got the CRT. It's not the rest of it's transistorized. I had to give up my fully vacuum tube. It was. The oscilloscope's older than I am. It's just post World War II, and and uh, uh, it had two handles on the top because you couldn't lift it with one hand, <laughs> and um, to keep it within five percent, you had to adjust it weekly. You know how often we've adjusted the oscilloscopes in the lab? Never. Nobody's going to slap it in their backpack. That's right. <laughs> <clears throat> True. That doesn't happen very often. We've lost one oscilloscope in 15 years. That's nothing. Well, I'll talk a little bit about uh, more about serial port, and um, we've been we've been sort of using the RS-232 connection to the to the chip as a as a black box been doing it since lab one and it's pretty easy to use as a black box because you because the 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 because somebody bothered to code up a nice version of put car and get car for you but sometimes you want to roll your own sometimes you want to do things like error detection or you want to Modify. It turns out that this particular USART can be set up as a address, addressed multi-device bus. If you can imagine such a twisted thing of using a serial connection to do multiple connections with an address scheme. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the low-level RS-232 stuff, low-level USART stuff just to uh, give you a feel for how it works in case you wanted to use it for something else, for instance, for an interface to an RF unit, um, interface to a, a, a transceiver. Turns out, by the way, SparkFun. You know SparkFun.com? Everybody go to SparkFun.com? Great site. Very cool stuff. They have a transceiver there uh, for $6.00. The cheapest transceiver I've seen. It defaults to operation at three, at 434 megahertz, which is illegal for you to use in the United States. <laughs> but through software, it could be configured up to 916 megahertz, which has the advantage of a being legal, 
as long as you don't radiate more than a milliwatt, and B, it has the antenna size. So the antenna is only uh, uh, nine centimeters long. About like that. So, so uh, um, it'd be fun to experiment with those. Runs off SPI, but what would really be cool, be a cool final project actually, is to use an AT tiny, an AT tiny, as an interface that takes in serial information from a computer on one side from another microcontroller, puts out SPI on the other side, does the level shifting and protocol shifting, and sets up the uh, sets up the, up the transceiver so that you have a module that you can use replaceably for years to come in the course. I mean, in other words, I'm getting you to do my work for me. So that, but it would, be, it would be really nice to have uh, such a system worked out that used a cheap transceiver and an AT Tiny all built on a board. It could, be, it could be the smallest final project in the last six years. It could be that big. By the way, the final, smallest final project I've ever seen fit inside of a sugar cube. It was less than a cubic centimeter. <clears throat> what was it? It was a complete uh, Atmel programmer. Bill? <laughs> <laughs> the, guy that, the guy that built it had, had the ability to, to look at a data sheet and see around the corners and figure out how to do things that the CPU was never actually designed to do by using edge, edge cases. Want to guess what he does now? <laughs> More edgy than that. Security. <laughs> he's working on it. He's running the Amazon cloud. Oh. <laughs> Mind bending. All right, so, uh, so the UART, let's do, do a high-level version of this first. So you have, you have some, on the SCK500, you, you have some sort of big connector, which is called a, a DB9. That's that the big gray plug you plug in. And a DB9 then connects over to a DB9 on the PC, STK 500. And this is a three-wire interface, transmit, receive, and ground, which was defined a long time ago. It's not obsolete. You're whispering, that's why it's obsolete, but it's not obsolete. It sure is slow. But it's everywhere, <clears throat> and uh, and the nice thing about it is that it's it's dead simple to write a driver for. That's why it'll, it'll never quite die. But it's <clears throat> it was designed originally for mechanical printers called teletypes. Any of you ever seen a teletype? It was actually originally a DB25, yeah, so right? Bigger. It was bigger, yeah. but the three-wire interface here was def designed to connect two teletypes together over a long distance. There were no sync in computers when this was designed in the 20s, 1920s. And because it had to go over a long distance and uh, noise levels being what they are, the voltages that were picked for this was that a one would be plus eight or so, and a zero would be minus 12. It's probably some handy battery voltage for the telephone company. I don't know. But the, the voltages going over these lines are rather large. And there's a chip on the STK500 called a MAX233 that takes in 0 to 5 on this side and puts out, 
puts out 8 to minus 12 on this side, inside the MAX 233 are a pair of DC to DC converters. So it's all magic. You don't know how it happens, but it happens. And you put in positive volts. You can actually use this as a negative power supply. Some people use MAX 232s as a negative power supply because it's kind of handy. So the output of the MCU is 0 to 5, actually inverted 0 to 5. And then the levels here are 8 and 12. So there's the MAX 233. And on the SDK 500, it's up near the DB9. Um, but the jumper that you're jumping from D0 and D1 over to that spare header is at 0 and 5 volt level. So then on the microcontroller, so there's a so there's a hardware USART universal asynchronous receive transmit. I can't remember what the S stands for. Universal synchronous asynchronous receive transmit. That's what it is. Bolted onto the side of the main M MCU. So this is hardware. It's a hardware unit that's bolted on just like the timers are bolted on. And the USART then consists of consists of a very weird register called UDR0, UART Data Register Channel 0, which is, a, which is split in an odd way. There are two copies of it. They're both called UDR0. One is read-only and the other is write-only. Oh. Huh. Okay, I'll tell you why in a minute. Out of this is a TX empty flag. Out of this is a car received flag. These can both throw interrupts. Then there's an 8-bit transfer. 8-bit transfer to a shift register which is clocked out using the BOD clock. That's what you set to 9600 bits per second or whatever. This is then shifted out through a serial line. This is the TX line. This would be D.1. Likewise, there's a separate shift register which is clocked at the BOD clock, which takes data from the receive line, D.0, shifts it into the shift register, and then when the shift register is full, clocks it over to UDR0. Because everything is copied, the hardware is copied. There's a separate transmit and receive buffer. The system is completely duplex. Duplex means it can transmit and receive exactly at the same time. You do not have to wait to transmit when you're receiving or vice versa. <clears throat> now, the software has to be full duplex also to make this work which means that it has to, if you want full duplex operation, if you want to be able to transmit and receive at the same time, you have to use interrupt driven routines. Or you have to interleave your transmit and receive in a way you don't want to think about. <clears throat> On the microcontroller we're using, you can run this, the bit rate, up to you can run the baud clock up to around a quarter of a million bits a second. Something like 250,000 bits per second. But on the STK 500, 
They used a cheap MAX 233 that only goes to 38 kilobaud. So that's the fastest you can run it off the STK 500. If you go to the, if you roll your own, if you build your own interface, and by the way, I have the parts to do that, you can build a little tiny board that has the level translator and the plug on it. If you roll your own with the 232 AC, I think it is, CP, I can't remember which one it is, it, it, it will go up above 115 kilobaud. <clears throat> so, the RS-232 standard includes not only the voltage levels, but what the data structure looks like. And the data structure is very simple, which is nice, and it looks like this. First of all, you'll notice there's no clock sent. There's no clock line. Therefore, it's asynchronous. <clears throat> every character that you send, every 8-bit character that you send, starts with a drop in level from about oh, 08 to minus 12 or so, which lasts for one bit time and is referred to as the start bit. When this edge of the start bit occurs, when the falling edge of the start bit occurs, the receiving end, the receiver, knows to start its clock. And so the way the system stays synchronized is the baud rates have to be set to the same value, and the receiving clock starts when the transmitting when the transmitting end produces an edge. <clears throat> then there are eight bit times Let's see if I can trip over this. Eight bit times, least significant bit first, always, followed by a stop bit. So, the stop bit has to be at level high for one clock time. So, to transmit 8 bits, we're going to send 10 bits. <clears throat> this, the particular microcontroller we're using Excuse me. Would like, let me step back and say, one thing you would like is to make sure that you haven't goofed up and set the baud rates to two different values, one at the transmitter and one at the receiver. The way this microcontroller detects that is it makes four measurements of the bit value for each clock time. They all have to match. <clears throat> then in the next clock time, it takes four measurements, and they all have to match. High or low, they have to match. Okay, finish one sentence. That means that you're making, over a period of 10 bits, you're making 40 measurements. Measurements. That implies that the clock rates between the two ends have to match within 2.5 percent, 1 over 40. And in fact, the specification says within 2 percent. So the clocks, the receiving baud rate has to be the same as the transmitting baud rate within 2 percent. There's no clock transmission, it's completely open loop. Jeremy. If you have like a sufficiently long cable, do you have to start worrying about delays in when the next <coughs> when the receiving end starts its baud clock and therefore like just delays in transition times. Well as as long as as long as the cable doesn't change dynamically during characters. Now now it's not that silly, right? Guy comes along, whomp, stomps on the cable, but that'd be so much fun, but I won't do it. 
right, stomps on the cable, and that changes the electrical length of the cable quite considerably. And so you could have dynamic changes where some, somebody is uncoiling and coiling a, a, a transmission cable, throwing it across the room, uh, standing on driving a car over it. And believe me, these things happen in the real world. So that is something to worry about. But as long as the transmission cable is, is static, then all the delays should be the same and, all the, and it should be just a constant offset and it should work. That stop bit could be set to out there or is that something else that can set up the stop bit? So you can set the stop bit to either one or two bits. And in the old days it used to be set to two because it was more, there was a little more redundancy. But nobody does that anymore. It's almost always set to one bit to get a little bit better throughput. <clears throat> now there's a slight, there's even another twist to this, and it turns out that the transmit is actually double buffered. So there's a shadow buffer behind UDR0. So you can queue up two characters to transmit. That means that you can start the next transition, the trans next transmission exactly on the next bit time after the stop bit if you have queued up a character. So if you want to transmit as fast as possible, you detect a TX empty, it's actually uh, UDR0 empty, jam another character into the buffer as fast as possible so that the shift register always has something to shift out. Now remember, the two rates are ridiculously different. Your code is running at 16,000 instructions per millisecond. This is producing one bit per millisecond at 9600 baud. you got, I'm sorry, one character per millisecond, one bit per hundred microseconds at 9600 baud. You have a long time to get that next character into the buffer. So in practice, you can always run the transmit at full speed if you want to, until you run out of memory. <clears throat> the receive end, as soon as you get a character received, then you have to deal with it. Typically you have to put it in a buffer, increment a buffer pointer, uh, maybe signal some process that there's a, a valid command. So a few dozen instructions, a few microseconds, so that you can easily keep up with a character which is coming in once per millisecond at 9600 baud. So if you want to transmit a string of like 10 characters, let's say, the, is there another internal buffer that like when you write it in C it handles it automatically or do you have to, is it going to sit there and wait until it's able to send it all out from the UR? The, uh, the answer is there is no automatic buffering system. And so you have to write the buffer system that keeps this full. That would typically be done in an interrupt service routine if you want to load it as fast as possible. In the case of <clears throat> put car, so the standard printf uses a put car that waits until TX is empty and then loads another character. So it's not as fast as it could be, but it's pretty fast. So it, it hangs on the printf statement until everything has been sent up. Absolutely, it's blocking. Right, the, the, the version in TRT uses a circular buffer that's maintained by, circuit, by, by t a tiny real time. So when you print, it's not actually going to the UART, it's going to a 200 character buffer, which is then clocked out by tiny real time using an interrupt service routine so it doesn't block. Currently, virtually every microcontroller has at least one USART, usually two or three. Ours only has one. 
but uh, there are other interfaces that are, are often used also. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, SPI is used and I2C are used. There are two other buses with different kinds of characteristics. Um, but the ser in terms of microcontroller, serial is everywhere. In terms of PC, nobody puts a serial port on a PC anymore. Wait a minute, ours have PC, I uh, have serial ports on them, and the reason is that I asked for it. Maybe I should have asked for two. But the as of next year, as of next year, we're going to go all to USB anyway, so there will be no more serial dongles. Yeah, you're the last year. Oh well. The end of a serial area. <laughs> It's like it's like the end of uh, soap opera, wasn't it? Just yeah. So, <clears throat> as the lab turns, <laughs> so I don't think I'll start on the register definition at this point. There's there's error, all kinds of error checking. You can check for a data overrun. That is to say, if you didn't read a character soon enough, you can find out. There's check for bad baud rate. There's check all kinds of cross checks that you can do that are not normally done by get car and put car. But if you want to make a reliable system, you could use. So five minutes. Questions on final projects. Comments on final projects. Ideas. Is anybody tempted by the transmit module using six dollar transceivers? Since that's a since that would be infrastructure for the course, I'll waive the budget on that one. You know what the power consumption is on? Uh, 50, uh, 10 mils. Not particularly good or bad. <clears throat> you can transmit at plus twenty dBs. That's ten milliwatts. That's illegal by a factor of ten. That's one reason I would like to have a buffer microcontroller on the board so that the clever user can't override the power limits. Nobody's tempted by that. Okay. <clears throat> it's a strict it's a it's a strictly infrastructure kind of project. Get a lot of use. I'll put your name on the board. What other ideas for final projects? Who wants to talk about their idea? How shy. How quiet. We have at least two groups doing neural nets. Maybe three. Yeah. You're doing neural net. Nick and Ned. Nick and Ned. Nick, Ned, and Nick. SVM being support vector. You can you do you think you can do the algorithm in fast enough? All right. What else? What a quiet group. Okay, let's go to lab.